It's a pleasure. And uh, this was uh, an exciting ASCO for uh, lung cancer, particularly. Uh, I think there was a lot of non small cell. Uh, one pivotal uh, presentation that we'll start with. Uh, these are my disclosures, and uh, Benet already presented them in the aggregate, but uh, you can see them again. Uh, so the Adora trial was a plenary session presentation that was preceded by a uh, release that the trial was positive for its primary endpoint of disease-free survival. And uh, so there was obviously going to be of excitement about this pioneering study that looks at targeted therapy and particularly uh, osimertinib as a third generation EGFR inhibitor in patients with resected stage 1b to 3a non-small cancer that harbors an activating EGFR mutation. Patients were randomized one to one between osimertinib and placebo and as I mentioned the primary endpoint was disease-free survival particularly in stage 2 and 3a uh, secondarily looking at a broader population with stage 1b disease and it also looked at disease-free survival at two three and four and five years as well as overall survival the study we knew was positive it was announced that it was unblinded early uh, due to efficacy uh, so uh, that was back in April I think and so uh, what what was what was really just to be determined was how big a benefit and some of the other details. Uh, here is the uh, baseline characteristics for the patients on the study. See that it was uh, predominantly women, uh, predominantly younger in their early days. Uh, two thirds to three quarters were never smokers and about two thirds, nearly two thirds were Asian. Uh, overwhelmingly adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma, I'm sorry, <coughs> adjuvant therapy was permitted in this trial before randomization to osimertinib or, uh, or placebo, but it wasn't mandated and a little disappointing that only in the presentation at ASCO, 55, 56% of patients got it. It was in the, the New England Journal paper that just came out reported as 60%. What's also notable is that it was a bit, almost evenly a third, a third, a third of patients with stage 1B to or 3A disease. The difference in overall survival, I'm sorry, in disease-free survival with a hazard ratio of 0.17. So really quite striking. This is for patients with stage two to three A disease and, and maturity is at 33%, uh, but particularly driven by a large, rate, a large rate of relapse in the recipients of placebo. And when you include the patients with stage one B disease, the hazard ratio goes down somewhat, but it's still 0.21 and a remarkable separation of the curves. When we look at the breakdown of the different patient characteristics, you can see that it's really essentially across the board, but patients with stage 1B disease, uh, and that's kind of in the middle there, had a half, you know, 0.5 for DFS not quite as favorable patients with stage uh, two or three A, uh, but no differences uh, in outcomes depending on whether patients had received adjuvant chemotherapy or not. Here again is the breakdown of by, by stage and you can see that it is most pronounced for stage two and three A and still there, but not as, impressive for stage 1b patients where the hazard ratio is 0.5 and uh, then here is an update from ESMO I uh, am focusing really on the ASCO presentation but there was one relevant bit of new information from ESMO and that's included in the New England Journal of Medicine paper by uh, 
Wu and colleagues on Adora, and that shows the CNS relapse rate was significantly better with osimertinib, and uh, the hazard ratio here is 0.18. Now, I would say it's important to look at overall survival. Here, the results are very immature, and uh, there's no clear difference yet, but uh, you wouldn't necessarily expect that at this point in the, the curves. Now, I should also mention that these this presentation is during uh, a period of follow-up about 20 months into the course of treatment. And this trial gave osimertinib for, or gives osimertinib for up to three years, which is really a very long duration. So this is during the time that patients are actively receiving osimertinib or placebo. And it's not entirely clear whether it is suppressing disease or curing disease. Now, another factor and particularly relevant in the adjuvant setting is uh, side effects. Uh, now, fortunately, most of us who use osimertinib know that it is uh, really generally quite well tolerated, but anything given for years at a time, even state, uh, even grade one and two toxicities are a, a real issue and diarrhea and skin related side effects, stomatitis were seen in a non-trivial rate. Uh, this was fortunately very rarely grade three or four, just one, two percent had grade three or four higher toxicities. But again, grade two or three rash, diarrhea, etc. become uh, challenging, if not uh, pro prohibitive, uh, when, when people are on it for years at a time. And I think a big question is as well, we know that some of these people can be cured without any treatment. So this is ther therapy side effect for some people who are essentially overtreated. Now, this is uh, a result. The trial came with great fanfare. It was less a presentation than a coronation. And, uh, but I, I do think there are some caveats. This trial was run globally and had a lot of variability, I believe, in the PET CT rates brain MRI versus, uh, there was mandated brain head imaging, but CT is a clearly inferior way to assess. And we also saw major differences and, and uh, relatively low levels of delivery of adjuvant chemotherapy. We don't have any data about whether the disease-free survival uh, based on whether patients underwent more or less rigorous staging. And I would just raise the point that if patients in many places were grossly or you know, clearly understaged, it shouldn't be any surprise that osimertinib leads to a much better disease-free survival if you're essentially treating low volume metastatic disease. Uh, clearly osimertinib is more effective for this than, than, uh, than uh, uh, placebo. So, I, I think we really need to learn more about whether it was uh, it, it differences in the quality of staging and overall care in different parts of the world that significantly to particularly the, the very high uh, relapse rate in the placebo arm, which is a higher relapse rate than we would expect to see based on stage. I, overall, I would say this is a clearly definitive answer for disease-free survival, but question whether it's really the wrong question. Uh, yes, disease-free survival shows a tremendous benefit, but this was completely expected for an EGFR TKI versus placebo. We've seen in, in other studies, most notably uh, single-arm phase twos, that you can get a great disease-free survival with EGFR TKI. They haven't been associated with an improvement in overall survival. And the question is whether you're really just suppressing disease while patients are on it and, and kind of building up to potential existence or patients have evidence of disease. And I'd also raise the question, particularly in a global forum, where does cost matter? I think it, it really is something that's hard to turn a blind eye to. This is a therapy that costs a quarter of a million dollars a year in the U.S. and some of these patients have already been cured. I think it's troubling to incur these costs passed out 
other people in society. Somebody is paying for it. Uh, and I think that in a setting like that, it would be really valuable to at least know that we are improving survival and not just making scans look better for a period of time. I would also caution, we got a little more information from a trial that was published a few years ago uh, called CTON 1105, or was just also called the Agib done in China. And it looked at gefitinib versus cisplatin and venerelbine. So this was an either or rather than, rather than uh, targeted therapy after the chemo. But it was for EGFR mutation positive patients, looked at disease-free survival as the primary endpoint. Hey that uh, the disease-free survival benefit was there the, for gefitinib over chemotherapy, but overall survival did not show a benefit. And this is a different agent. Gefitinib is inferior, and this was uh, just for a, a, a couple of years of therapy. And, uh, but, but I would also point out that uh, this is when you look at the disease-free survival curves, they both head south, and by three, four years, very few patients are alive without relapse. And this is a picture of understaging, and that's always been an issue with this trial that we felt that it's of limited value because so many patients were considered clinical stage three but didn't have a PET CT, didn't get good brain imaging or mediastinal staging. I would have no confidence that these patients didn't have stage four disease. And this is the pattern that you would see for a lot of understaging. And, and I would question whether that is also potentially contributing to some of the results in Adora. The, the uh, sponsors haven't presented any of the differences in either extracranial or CNS relapse rate, depending on the baseline imaging that a patient has had. I think that's critical. I'd also raise the question uh, that adjuvant osimertinib may lead to a decrease in the use of adjuvant chemotherapy, and that would be a mistake. Uh, we saw in this trial relatively disappointing rates of delivery of adjuvant chemotherapy, and that was with a placebo arm. So people clearly just were swayed by this idea that taking a pill would cover them in a way that so they don't need that old fashioned nasty chemotherapy. But in the little bit of data we looks at the benefit that patients with EGFR mutations get from adjuvant chemo, it's actually very substantial and eclipses even the benefit in patients with EGFR wild types. So these are patients who should not be considered as having OS or any other intervention obviate the need for chemo. This is really something that should be added to rather than replacing it. I'd also raise the caution, as I said, about the survival, that it may not translate to overall survival benefit. And people uh, have pointed to the magnitude of benefit and said, yes, but this is amazing. It's a hazard ratio of 0 0.17, 0 0.2, but when we look at the optimal trial in stage four, that also had a hazard ratio for PFS of 0.16 that did not translate to any improvement in overall survival. And we did not presume that an improvement in DFS while patients are receiving the active treatment in question is going to translate to an overall survival benefit if the patients on the, on the uh, placebo arm get unfettered access to osimertinib, the best treatment that we have at a time of relapse, so that we might potentially do just as well for overall survival without over-treating a fraction of patients, significant uh, population of patients, for years at a time. So looking at the impact on practice, I would say despite these issues that I've raised, it's hard to ignore that, and I think we shouldn't ignore the DFS of 0.17, uh, particularly for the patients with stage 2 and 3A disease. And I would anticipate FDA approval in short order. I think it's, uh, it makes it very compelling to test for EGFR. Uh, patients with resected disease who would qualify. I think an open question is whether 
we will seek NGS testing and would do with all of the other mutations we might find, a MET, a RET, an ALK, a ROS. Will we extrapolate? Will we extrapolate to treating patients who were qualified for Adora, but if you are testing and find an EGFR mutation in someone with a 3.3 centimeter tumor, will you recommend it? Will patients expect or demand it? And this is for patients who are even more likely to be cured. Will we get to three years and people decide we should really be on it forever until progression? Uh, because how can you honestly expect that you've cured someone if at two and a half years that wasn't enough? There's no cancer that is cured after three years, but not after two and a half years of treatment. Is this to lead to some patients being overtreated with an incredibly expensive therapy indefinitely? Again, are we going to have this extend out to other mutations? And even when we don't have any data for it, let alone overall survival, uh, just because of the proof of principle here. Uh, we'll need to learn more. We'll need to get overall survival. But I also think it will be important, very important, to get more information about the staging and geography of the relapse rates to see how much it was the underlying biology and how much it was related to where patients were treated and what staging they had. Turning to the EGFR setting in stage four, just a bit of an update on erlotinib and bevacizumab. They actually have an approval for erlotinib and ramacirumab based on the relay trial, but not bevacizumab. But this information about the combination of EGFR and, uh, and um, uh, anti-angiogenic therapy, I think, is informative. Uh, what we saw in a smaller phase two trial with erlotinib bev versus erlotinib was no improvement in survival, despite a very impressive uh, in, uh, improvement in progression-free survival, some of the same theme I touched on. And uh, here, what we saw with uh, with uh, NEJ026, which was a larger phase three study, was a significant improvement in progression-free survival with erlotinib and bevacizumab, but again, associated with no improvement in overall survival. So I personally would say that this really dampens my enthusiasm for not just this combination, but the concept of adding even with an FDA approved regimen like ramacirumab and, uh, and Erlotta based on the relay trial, uh, no, no evidence that this is translating to improvements in how long patients are living. I'll turn now to non-molecularly selected patients. Here's the Checkmate 9LA study presented by REC and colleagues, and it is for patients without an EGFR mutation or ALK rearrangement, but could have any degree of PDL1 expression, and was also open to either squamous or non-squamous histology. This looked at a chemo comparator arm, uh, which is becoming a little outdated by 2019, 2020, uh, but compares to a, a, a novel approach of NEVO and IPI together in a, in a tolerable regimen where IPI is given at just one meg per kg every six weeks and chemo given for two cycles just at the beginning and then discontinued with the idea that this is a way to really address the, our concerns about getting in front of the cancer in patients with rapidly growing disease and not missing the opportunity if patients may progress through first-line chemo or first-line immunotherapy alone uh, and then miss the opportunity to, to get something subsequently. So kind of everything up front, then dropping the chemo very quickly. This looked at overall survival as the primary and had secondary endpoints of PFS response rate and efficacy by PDL1 expression. You can see the treatment and exposure, and, uh, and it was uh, more than twice as long with Nevo Ipi plus chemo. And uh, what you can see, obviously, is that Nevo Ipi uh, was not given to the chemo arm and given uh, for a median of nine doses of uh, Nevo, four doses of Ipi and uh, that 93% of patients got the expected two doses of chemo on the combined arm of nevo chemo, 
and three quarters got the four cycles of chemo and the chemo alone arm. Far more patients, 21% uh, versus 8% were still on treatment in the immunotherapy based arm. And here is the overall survival with a minimum follow up of a little over eight months. This was what was submitted to ASCO. And you can see the uh, median overall survival improving by about three and a half months hazard ratio of 0.69. And it's certainly statistically significant. I think it's more impressive to see the overall survival updated. This is uh, when it was presented at ASCO with four months longer follow-up, and you can see that the hazard ratio holds up. It's actually a little bit uh, better, and uh, the difference in median overall survival now uh, approaching five months and a clear and maintained separation of the curves over time. Uh, but this is still relatively immature data compared to some of the other studies we have in this setting. It just looks quite promising. When we look at the subgroup analysis, you can see that nearly every group benefited. Uh, never smokers, not as much as a small group, and perhaps that included some patients with other driver mutations that weren't detected. And uh, maybe not surprisingly, some of the older patients over 70, 75 and older, another small group, so we can only uh, interpret this with caution, may not have benefited uh, as much from a, a, such an aggressive regimen. Now, importantly, when we look at a breakdown of which patients got the benefit, this is covered in the forest plot, but just to show it graphically, patients with non-squamous and squamous histology had the exact same or remarkably similar benefit with the nevo chemo arm, whether you had non-squamous on the left or squamous on the right, histology, both groups had a 10 to more than 10, even more than 20% improvement in one year uh, survival. And when we look at pdl one expression, I think this is quite important as we prioritize our approaches in the setting. Patients uh, looking just at the top left and right with pdl one less than 1% or greater than or equal to 1%, both had uh, a remarkably comparable improvement in overall survival with nevo plus the two cycles of chemo. And when you look on the bottom left and right, you can see that uh, breaking down the pdl one positives into low or high, it is also very, very similar benefits across the board. So here, the degree of pdl one expression doesn't matter, and it is really comparably very significant improvement in overall survival across the spectrum of pdl one expression. Here's progression-free survival. The hazard ratio of 0.68 really uh, uh, corroborates what we've seen with uh, overall survival. The separation of the curves really doesn't occur until about four months in and then is maintained over time. And, and as a common theme, we do see a higher 25%, which is very appropriate and expected for chemo versus 38% with nevo ipi plus chemo. Very few patients with the combination showing uh, progression as their first or best response and 84% disease control rate. Uh, and another very common theme is that uh, nevo ipi uh, regimens tend to have a very impressive tail of the curve here. And so this is still, as I mentioned, early data, but these responses tend to be some of the longest that we've seen uh, and are particularly encouraging for asking the question of whether this, this particular backbone, this regimen may be associated with a remarkable long uh, duration of response and, and, and sustained benefit. All that said, it's not without some toxicities. You have some of the toxicities of a nevo ipi regimen, a, a, a well-scheduled uh, and tolerated one generally, uh, with some chemotherapy, and 25% of patients had grade three or four toxicities. That's more than with the chemo alone, um, and no difference in treatment-related deaths. I don't think there was really any surprises in the toxicity profiles. Uh, of course, patients four cycles of chemo had more side effects related to chemo than the patients who got two si uh, cycles of chemo. And the side effects with the chemo immunotherapy arm 
we're really recapitulating what we've seen previously, skin, uh, a lot of uh, thyroid, endocrine issues, uh, GI. hepatic and renal and pulmonary, as well as hypersensitivities, but these, the, the, the clear majority are grade one and two and not more than that. So uh, immunotherapy, uh, particularly with this I, 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 I'm sorry, ipilimumab given at one milligram per kilogram just every six weeks was uh, really well tolerated overall. But in terms of implications for practice, it, it, this was interesting because the FDA approved it uh, before we actually saw any data uh, publicly. Um, it is significantly better than chemotherapy, but that is our comparator from 2017, not really a comparator for 2019 or 20. And it's not known whether this is clearly better than uh, maybe Pembro monotherapy for patients with high PDL1 or uh, chemo Pembro for many other patients. So it's absolutely a compelling option, but it, it's not necessarily. Uh, shown to be superior to what people are already doing. And I would consider it an appealing option for patients with an aggressive cancer, those with high burden who are experiencing more pain every week or two, losing weight rapidly, and really just trying to get both shots on goal at once with chemo and immunotherapy without the risk of having a patient miss that opportunity because you start embryo and then they progressed and they were in a wheelchair. But I would say there's a couple of additional potential benefits. Uh, the tail of the curve may be higher here, and, uh, and I would wonder whether this gives the best chance of long-term favorable results out to two years, three years, or longer. And uh, it does, I would say, still leave the potential utility of two cycles of chemo, uh, uh, after only two cycles of chemo, of going back to a chemo doublet upon progression if that's some reasonable period of time alone. You haven't exhausted the benefit of, of uh, chemotherapy after just two cycles. The last study I wanted to point to is, uh, is with trastuzumab deruxtecan, and uh, it's, it is uh, presented by SMIT. It's uh, commercially known as in HER2. It's used in breast cancer, uh, though, as I'll show in a, high, a lower dose in breast cancer than was studied here. And it is, an conjugate and uh, really prominent class of therapies, and it's got a humanized anti-HER2 antibody as the, uh, as the target seeker, uh, and that is linked to a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor payload, so uh, really promising for delivering the chemo right where it's needed. Uh, at, a, at a molecular level. This is the Destiny Lung 01 trial, and it actually looked at two different cohorts, one for HER2 expressing or overexpressing tumors with uh, non-small cell, the other being with a HER2 mutation. And the, the focus of this presentation was entirely on the cohort mutation positive non-small cell. These were patients who had already been treated, uh, 42 patients, uh, almost all having received platinum-based chemo as shown on the right. The majority also receiving immunotherapy and one in five having received docetaxel. And this is a thing waterfall plot. You can see the vast majority of the time it's heading down. So just, uh, just about every patient has some degree of tumor shrinkage and 62% nearly uh, achieved a confirmed uh, objective response uh, that uh, for a disease control rate of over 90% and progression-free survival median of over a year, 14 months. Here you can see that uh, many arrows at the, the right side of those swimmer plots are on ongoing treatment. It's, it's obviously still early days and many of them are just a, a half year to a year in but a lot of these patients are still doing well on treatment without progression. You can't read too much into a single arm study with 42 patients uh, in terms of the median, uh, you know, the, the curves for progression free and overall survival, but it is encouraging to see a median of over a year and an overall survival that hasn't been reached yet for this uh, cohort. 
heart. Now, toxicity was uh, about osimertinib oh, in the adjuvant setting. Uh, anything, if this is meant to be a longitudinal therapy that has nausea, vomiting, diarrhea ongoing can be a, a real challenge. And uh, that was an issue as was uh, a drop in neutrophil count in many patients. So there was that. And then there was uh, interstitial lung disease that developed in five patients out of the 42, so 12% or so. Uh, this did not occur Im uh, immediately, but rather an immediate almost Uh, there were no grade five d episodes, but it is something to, I think, monitor and be cautious about. So impact on practice, this is not approved for lung cancer. And uh, I, I think we will need to see further studies, but I certainly consider this to be an encouraging efficacy signal. Uh, the numbers are relatively small, a few dozen patients, and we don't have incredibly long follow-up. But this is the kind of waterfall plot that we finally hope to see for the HER2 positive population where we've identified them now for several years, but have never had an agent that had response rates north of 50%. That said, toxicity is a challenge, interstitial lung disease, as I mentioned, nausea, diarrhea, diminished appetite. But I would also say the dose here was higher than in breast cancer, and I'm hopeful that that can be uh, fine-tuned, that maybe at the dose in breast cancer, which is 5.4 milligrams per kilogram, uh, you'd see better uh, balance, better therapeutic index. And I'm hopeful that this will be our first HER2 therapy that will make HER2 uh, an appropriate one to add to our pantheon of targets that we have a great treatment for when we find it early on. So uh, that's the tour of kind of key, key findings from ASCO, some uh, likely practice changing, really paradigm changing results in early stage, but also highlighting our uh, need to learn more and what we should expect from adjuvant therapies that is an ongoing debate. And, and also I think, questions about how to best conduct global trials and whether real world results from places that aren't our world in the U.S. should change practice. Uh, so some difficult questions, um, but also potential new implications for immunotherapy options and uh, a new potential target in HER2. So I hope that's helpful. I guess we're going to take questions as a panel, so I'll defer on that, but thanks for your interest and attention. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Uh, so that we have a, maybe we can answer this really quickly. So there is a question from Dr. Amar. How was HER2 testing done in DESTINY trial? I don't have that detail. I, um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I'd have to look that up. I'm not exactly sure. Sure, just because in breast cancer, it's usually you do the immunohistochemistry or the fish testing. And when it's discovered through the regular uh, like on type DX or something in breast cancer, that's not applicable. So yeah, I, 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 I strongly suspect, I believe that again in lung cancer now, the, you know, the, at this point, especially after MET and RET, but I think it was even the case before those were, we had uh, targeted therapies approved, NGS had become kind of the rule of the land. So uh, it's overwhelmingly picked up not by specifically looking for it as much yes. as doing a broad panel yeah. and picking it up yeah. as a as a discrete mutation in that panel. And what's the percentage of positivity generally in lung cancer? About two, two, three oh, percent. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Jack, uh, I, Rafael, I just yeah, yeah ahead, I was going to say that uh, I don't know the answer for sure, but I went ahead and, and looked at the protocol that we're open one of the Destiny uh, studies, and it's I see. Uh, that how they are uh, enrolling patients, uh, IHC 2 plus and 3 plus for HER2. But that's, again, that to be clear, they have two different cohorts for that study. One right. is for IHC 2 to 3 plus and one is for mutation. They didn't present the data yeah. for the IHC base. So that's a, a separate question. That's the this other year, group. Yeah, yeah it's, it's sure. exactly. So uh, a related, but not the same question. Great. Thank you so uh, much.
Thank you. Thank you, Jack. That was an outstanding presentation.